Some moments do not need any words, but some do. This is the story of a single genetic mutation that gave us the power of speech and sparked an explosion of innovation. In 1969, archaeologists working in Israel's Kafzeh cave made a discovery that would rewrite our understanding of when humans first began to speak. They found a 100,000 year old burial site where a late adolescent had been laid to rest with deer antlers placed carefully across the body. But it wasn't just the deliberate burial that stunned researchers, it was what they found in the throat. The position of the hyoid bone. This tiny bone, no bigger than a coin, was the oldest hard evidence that ancient humans had the physical capability for complex speech far earlier than anyone imagined. For anatomically modern Homo sapiens, this is till date the oldest known hyoid bone fossil. It is important to note that the oldest known fossil evidence of a human-like hyoid bone comes from the middle Pleistocene site of Cima de los Huesos in the Sierra de Atapuerca, Spain. These fossils, attributed to Homo heidelbergensis, date to around 530,000 years ago and show a morphology virtually identical to that of modern humans and Neanderthals. But having the equipment doesn't mean they used it. A piano can sit silent for years. The real evidence for speech came from what archaeologists call the symbolic explosion that began around 50,000 years ago. Suddenly, after millions of years of using the same stone tools, humans began innovating at breakneck speed. Cave walls erupted with elaborate paintings. Jewelry appeared, shells transported hundreds of miles inland, drilled with perfect holes. Musical instruments emerged, bone flutes that could play haunting melodies. These weren't just tools for survival, they were tools for sharing ideas, emotions, and stories. At Blombos Cave in South Africa, archaeologists found pieces of ochre engraved with complex geometric patterns, the first abstract art. These crosshatch designs weren't random, they followed rules, patterns that repeated. Someone was thinking symbolically, and more importantly, they were likely explaining these symbols to others. Before speech, learning happened through observation and imitation alone. A young hunter might watch an elder craft a spear point a hundred times before getting it right. Each generation had to rediscover techniques through trial and error. Knowledge died with individuals, but with language, everything changed. Consider the Levallois technique, a complex method of creating stone tools that appeared around 300,000 years ago. It requires planning five or six steps ahead, visualizing the final tool within the raw stone before making the first strike. Archaeologists trying to recreate these tools without verbal instruction fail 90% of the time. But with spoken guidance, strike here at this angle, then flip the stone. Success rates soar. The archaeological record shows that once humans could speak, technology spread like wildfire. The same tool-making techniques appeared simultaneously across vast distances. Even more telling is what anthropologists call cumulative culture. The ability to build on previous innovations. A stone knife becomes a hafted knife, which becomes a spear, which becomes an atlatl, which eventually becomes a bow and arrow. Each innovation requires not just creativity, but the ability to explain improvements to others. The story of human speech truly begins to crystallize with the discovery of FOXP2, dubbed the language gene by the media, though its role is far more complex. In 2001, geneticists studying a British family known as KE made a breakthrough. Half the family members across three generations suffered from severe speech and language disorders. They could understand language but struggled to coordinate the complex mouth movements required for speech. Their attempts to speak sounded like they were talking with their mouths full of marbles. When researchers sequenced their DNA, they found the culprit, a mutation in a single gene called FOXP2. This gene acts like a master switch, controlling hundreds of other genes involved in brain development, particularly in areas controlling speech and language. But here's where it gets fascinating. FOXP2 isn't unique to humans. Chimps have it, mice have it, even songbirds have it. So what makes ours special? When scientists compared human FOXP2 to our closest relatives, they found something extraordinary. While the gene had remained almost unchanged for millions of years of mammalian history, humans carry two specific mutations that no other species has. These changes occurred sometime between 200,000 and 50,000 years ago, exactly when archaeological evidence suggests language emerged. The plot thickened in 2007 when scientists sequenced FOXP2 from Neanderthal bones found in Spain's El Cidron cave. The results shocked everyone, 
Neanderthals had the exact same FOXP2 mutations as modern humans. This discovery shattered the comfortable narrative that speech made us special, that it separated us from our primitive cousins. If Neanderthals could speak, why did they disappear while we thrived? The answer might lie not in whether they could speak, but in how they spoke. Recent genetic studies suggest that while Neanderthals had the basic machinery for speech, subtle differences in other genes might have limited their linguistic capabilities. They had the piano, but perhaps could only play chopsticks while we composed symphonies. Archaeological evidence supports this. Neanderthal sites show remarkable consistency in tool-making techniques over hundreds of thousands of years. The same hand axes, made the same way, generation after generation. Meanwhile, modern human sites from the same period show constant innovation, experimentation, and regional variation. The hallmarks of communities sharing and building upon ideas through language. The evolution of speech required more than just one gene. It demanded a complete reorganization of our anatomy. Our ancestors paid a deadly price for the ability to speak. The descended larynx that allows us to produce the full range of vowel sounds also makes us mammals at significantly higher risk of choking to death on food. Every meal became slightly more dangerous, but the trade-off, the ability to communicate complex ideas, was worth the risk. The human tongue became more flexible and muscular than any apes. Our lips became more mobile, able to form the precise shapes needed for consonants like P and B. Our breathing changed too. We gained fine control over exhalation, allowing us to modulate sound into the complex patterns of speech. But the most dramatic changes happened in our brains. The areas devoted to controlling the mouth and tongue expanded dramatically. Broca's area, crucial for speech production, grew to be six times larger than the equivalent region in chimp brains. Wernicke's area, essential for understanding language, became uniquely human in its connections and complexity. Brain imaging of people speaking shows a symphony of neural activity. Dozens of brain regions fire in precise coordination, turning abstract thoughts into air pressure waves that carry meaning. It's the most complex motor activity humans perform, requiring more neural coordination than playing violin or performing surgery. Linguists studying the world's most ancient languages have found tantalizing clues about possible first words humans spoke. Despite the vast diversity of modern languages, certain words appear remarkably similar across unrelated language families. Mama appears in languages from Mandarin, Mama, to Swahili, Mama, to ancient Sumerian, Ama. This isn't coincidence, these are likely among the first words human babies can physically produce, and possibly among the first words our species ever spoke. MIT linguist Shigeru Miyagawa proposed that human language emerged from the merger of two communication systems, the expressive system of birdsong, conveying emotional states, and the lexical system of primates, connecting sounds to meanings. The result was something unprecedented in nature, a communication system that could express both emotion and infinite meaning. Some linguists believe they can reconstruct fragments of humanity's original language by comparing common elements across all language families. As mentioned earlier, words for basic concepts like mother, water, fire, and to give show suspicious similarities worldwide. These might be echoes of the first conversations our ancestors had around campfires 100,000 years ago. Language didn't just change what we could do, it changed who we were. Robin Dunbar, an evolutionary psychologist at Oxford, discovered that brain size in primates correlates with social group size. Based on our brain size, humans should live in groups of about 150, the famous Dunbar's number. But language allowed us to break this barrier. Without language, social bonding in primates happens through grooming, a time-intensive activity that limits group size. You can only pick fleas off so many relatives in a day. But with language, we could groom multiple individuals simultaneously through conversation. Gossip, far from being a trivial pastime, became the glue that held larger societies together. Language allowed us to share social information about who could be trusted, who was a skilled hunter. This social intelligence created pressure for even more sophisticated language skills. Those who could persuade, charm, and negotiate had more offspring. Language became sexually selected, like a peacock's tail an elaborate display that signaled genetic fitness. The most profound change wasn't in our throats or even our brains, it was in our consciousness itself. Language gave us the ability to think about things that don't exist. We could discuss the hunt we would undertake tomorrow, debate whether the spirits of ancestors watched over us, or imagine what lay beyond the next mountain. 
This symbolic thinking appears suddenly in the archaeological record. At Çatalhöyük in Turkey, old houses contain elaborate murals depicting vultures carrying away human heads. Not a scene anyone would want to witness, but a symbolic representation of death and transformation. The humans who painted these weren't just conscious, they were conscious of being conscious. Cave paintings from Lascaux to Sulawesi don't just depict animals, they show animals that don't exist, composite creatures that blend human and animal features. These therianthropes, human-animal hybrids, represent humanity's first recorded myths, stories that could only exist in minds capable of language. As humans spread across the globe, our language gene continued to evolve. Recent studies have found that FOXP2 shows signs of strong positive selection in human populations, meaning that variations in this gene continue to provide survival advantages even after speech emerged. Different populations show subtle variations in FOXP2 and related genes that might influence language learning ability, tone perception, and even the physical ability to produce certain sounds. The click consonants of Khoisan languages in Africa, the tonal systems of Chinese languages, the rolled R's of Spanish. These aren't just cultural choices, but reflect subtle genetic variations in populations. Some people genuinely cannot produce certain sounds due to genetic differences in mouth and throat structure. This genetic diversity and language capability has been crucial to human survival. Different groups developed different linguistic strengths, some better at producing precise tones, others at rapid consonant clusters, still others at complex grammar. When these populations met and mixed, their children inherited a richer genetic toolkit for language. Talking about visual symbols that clearly represent language appear around 35,000 years ago in European caves. These weren't pictures, but abstract symbols, dots, lines, and geometric shapes that appear consistently across different sites. The same 32 symbols appear repeatedly from Spain to Russia, suggesting a shared symbolic system that might represent humanity's first attempt at writing. At the Danube River sites of Vincha culture, 7,000-year-old clay tablets bear symbols that look tantalizingly like writing. Though many remain undeciphered, these marks show systematic organization. Symbols appear in consistent orders, suggesting grammar. Someone was trying to make speech visible, to capture words in clay. The explosion of written language around 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and Mesoamerica was an independent invention. It was the culmination of tens of thousands of years of symbolic thinking made possible by the language gene. Each writing system emerged in societies that had reached a complexity impossible without sophisticated spoken language. Today, every human on Earth carries the genetic legacy of that first speaking ancestor. When we learn a second language, we're pushing the boundaries of what those genes make possible. When we struggle to pronounce foreign words, we're bumping against the physical constraints our particular genetic heritage imposes. Modern genetic testing can now identify individuals at risk for language disorders by looking for FOXP2 mutations. Gene therapy will soon be able to correct these mutations, giving voice to those who struggle to speak. We're approaching the power to engineer the very genes that gave us language. Brain-computer interfaces are beginning to decode the neural patterns of speech, allowing paralyzed patients to speak through machines. These technologies reveal the intricate dance of neurons that FOXP2 and its partner genes orchestrate every time we open our mouths to speak. The history of human language isn't finished. Text messaging and social media are creating new forms of communication that blend writing and speech. Emojis represent a return to pictographic communication, but enhanced by the grammatical sophistication language gave us. We're developing new ways to convey tone and emotion in digital text, the ancient challenge of making feelings visible. Some linguists predict that within 200 years, machine translation will make learning foreign languages obsolete. Others argue that language diversity will collapse, with a few dominant languages absorbing all others. Still others believe we're on the verge of developing entirely new forms of communication, direct brain-to-brain -brain transmission that bypasses speech entirely. But whatever comes next will build upon the foundation laid by that first genetic mutation. It's a story of how a species conquered the planet not through strength or speed, but through the ability to share ideas. We became the dominant species on Earth because we could tell each other stories, teach our children lessons, and build knowledge across generations. Today, 8 billion humans speak over 7,000 languages, each one a unique solution to the challenge of converting thought into sound. From the clicking consonants to the tonal complexities of Mandarin to the recursive grammar of English, each language represents a different experiment in human communication. 
all made possible by that ancient genetic gift. When we speak, we're not just communicating, we're participating in an unbroken chain of conversation that stretches back 100,000 years. If you found this journey into the world of the complex human speech fascinating, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. There's a whole universe of such genetic mutations and unseen connections waiting to be discovered, and every subscription helps bring more of these incredible stories to life. I will see you in next video. Thanks for watching.